in here with my mom real quick. Say hi, mom. Hi, mom. Warning, mom joke ahead. <laughs> You're making me look very alabaster. I wear sunscreen inside. I know, she's so Because weird. UVA can come in That's through the thinks. windows. <laughs> That's what the, that is what, on the, it's true. They fly in on the backs of aliens. I have an exciting announcement that you may or may not have already heard. It's my Bartonella Babe merch! <laughs> I have two designs. The one I'm wearing says Buck Bartonella. You can see my logo right here. And mine says, I love the mostest, someone with Bartonellosis. Aww! Aww. 25% of all proceeds go to the Bartonella Project at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And the research team there has been working hard for 10 years and is still working hard so that Bartonella can be recognized as a major contributor to chronic debilitating illness. So that's why I chose to donate 25% of the proceeds to that particular fund. Buck, verb, to oppose or resist. We are strong Bartonella buddies, even when we don't feel like it. And in case you missed it, Buck also happens to rhyme with another word that many of us yell a lot. What do you mean? Or, or at least want to. I yell it a lot. How about you? Uh, when I bang my shin on the, <laughs> on the dishwasher. So the every day. <laughs> And so for the other design, I wanted to make something for parents, friends, caretakers who have a loved one that's suffering from Bartonellosis. These people intimately know the physical and psychological pain that their loved ones go through and are willing to do whatever it takes to help their loved one regain their health. So this design is for you and you. Aww. Mom, what kind of apparel do we have? We have short and long sleeve t-shirts, crew neck sweatshirts, and hoodies. So to visit my merch store and buy my merch, you can go to this link right here. And this company is changing their name. So if that link doesn't work or expires, there will definitely be the updated link in the video description box down below and in the pinned comment underneath this video. Jake. Yes. What are they changing their name to? Oh, they're changing it to spring from Teespring to spring. So I'll also put a link up here to the eye and that'll take you to the full video on my merch where I explain everything in more detail. And finally, just one more thing before we get into the video. Buck, Buck Bartonella. Hi, Bartonella buddies. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jake. What should I call this eye look? I'm thinking flossy, mossy. The the oh, the flossy mossy. This video is going to pick up right where I left off on my previous video on the treatment of Bartonellosis. So if you haven't watched that yet, I suggest that you hit pause now, go watch that, and then come back here. Nothing in this video is intended as medical advice. I'm not a doctor. You're an autonomous individual who's perfectly capable of making good or poor choices all on your own. Now let's get into it. So let's start off with these couple of questions. What is the difference between rifampin and rifabutin? And if the Bartonella become resistant to rifampin, will they also be resistant to rifabutin? The first thing I want to say is that almost no one on the internet who says that their Bartonella infection is resistant to rifampin knows this for a fact. The only way someone would know this for a fact is if scientists were able to isolate the Bartonella from the person's blood, culture it in vitro, and then test its susceptibility to rifampin. And as you can imagine, this is rarely done, and if it is done, it's mostly in a research setting. The next thing that people need to understand understand is that any time you take antibiotics for any infection, you run the risk of breeding resistance for almost any microbe in your body. I would say that in general, science knows relatively little about antibiotic resistance, especially in comparison to the threat that antibiotic resistance poses to humankind the world over. And I know that antibiotic resistance is very, very scary. This was something that I worried about incessantly in the beginning of my illness. And both of my BLMDs told me not to worry about it. And I wish I could go back in time and tell myself to snap the hell out of it. 
So if you're worried about this issue, hopefully you can snap out of it too. It is not uncommon for people to plateau on the clarithromycin and rifampin combination. Is this because the Bartonella are resistant to rifampin or is it because the antibiotics haven't penetrated the tissue deeply enough? Rifabutin penetrates both cells and tissues much better than rifampin. In a study of rats, it was shown that rifabutin penetrates tissue up to 14 times greater than rifampin. Does this mean that rifabutin penetrates tissue up to 14 times higher in humans as well? Well, humans aren't exactly rats, and I'm not sure that you can do this type of study in humans because the rats were killed and then their organs were dissected. So, I don't know, but we can extrapolate from this study that rifabutin has much better tissue penetration. And rifabutin penetrating cells is super important because we know that Bartonella lives intracellularly. In my interview with Amy and Jack, Amy talks about how Jack got better on the clarithromycin and rifampin combination, but he eventually plateaued. He also never had a Herxheimer reaction on this combination. Now, to be clear, you don't need to Herx to get better, but when Jack switched to rifabutin, after about eight or nine days of only being on 150 milligrams once a day, he ran a fever of 103. Jack continued to have lots of herxing throughout his treatment as he continued to up the rifabutin dosage, and Amy knows that rifabutin was essential to his healing. If you want to learn more about their experience, I'll put the link to the interview in the video description box. Dr. Moziani also mentions in his webinar that Bartonella may persist because they are protected in biofilms. A biofilm is basically a slimy substance of cells stuck to one another that protects them from the host's immune system and the penetration of some antibiotics. An example of a biofilm is plaque on your teeth. Ooh, gross. How old are you? I also one time watched Botched, the surgeon, he took out this woman's uh, breast implant. A lot of biofilms are microscopic, and he was saying that there was so much biofilm that it was visible to the naked eye. Gross. Now that is really gross. Many doctors use various supplements that may help break down biofilms, and some examples of this are NAC, which stands for N-acetylcysteine, or serapeptase. Bartonella may also persist protected in cysts in the body, and I want to be clear that this is different than a bacterial cyst form. Bartonella do not have a cyst form. So back to resistance. I'm not saying that resistance is impossible. Of course it's possible. I mean, bacteria becoming resistant to something is evolution and Darwinism at its finest. Bacteria can mutate and become resistant to many things, including essential oils and even phage therapy. We also know from the scientific literature that macrolide resistant strains of Bartonella hensley do exist in the natural environment. One study found an erythromycin resistant strain that was isolated from the lymph node of a 12 year old girl and she had not been treated with antibiotics. The authors hypothesized that the girl acquired the erythromycin resistant strain either from an animal that had acquired it from somewhere else or an animal that had been treated with macrolides. So when someone says they have a rifamycin resistant strain, you have to ask if it truly is a resistance issue or rather a persistence slash penetration issue or both. So resistance would mean that the bacteria, and not necessarily every single cell of that bacteria, but at least a proportion, have developed a mutation that makes it resistant to being killed by the antibiotic. But my question is, and I don't have the answer to this, but since Bartonella is a relatively slow dividing bacteria. How easily or quickly does this type of resistance happen, especially in a multi-drug protocol? In my interview with Amy and Jack, we discuss how some of Dr. Moziani's patients along the Mississippi corridor have a more resistant time with treatment, and so that may or may not indicate a resistant strain in the environment there or some other explanation. If, like Jack, you have plateaued on the clarithromycin and rifampin combination, you can ask your doctor about switching the rifampin over to rifabutin. Jack also plateaued on two pills of rifabutin twice a day. So when this happened, he switched over to three pills of rifabutin all at once, which elicited further herxing and further healing. 
So the last thing I would say about rifamycin resistant strains of Bartonella is that treatment for chronic infections like Bartonellosis and tuberculosis can often take a long time. It can take a long time for some people to see symptom relief and feel better, and so that makes it even more important that you feel very confident that your symptoms are indeed due to a Bartonella infection. The reason why the rifamycin class is thought to be so effective for these types of latent infections is because they are thought to work during brief periods of bacterial metabolism. In other words, rifampin works on bacterial cells that are mostly quiescent or dormant or asleep that have brief periods of metabolizing or waking up, which is when the antibiotic can exert its positive effects. I started doing the air quotes to indicate when I was quoting from an article, but then I started doing the air quotes when I was doing anthropo- anthro- doing anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism? Pomo? Pomophism. Por- no. Pomorphism. Anthropomorphism. <laughs> Then I started doing the air quotes because I was doing anthropomorphism on uh, the bacteria waking up and asleep. So please don't freak out about antibiotic resistance until a Bartonella expert is broaching this topic as a possibility for you. And I don't want to take away from the experiences of people who truly do believe that they have a resistant strain. I more just want to allay any unnecessary fears. There are many alternative explanations for why someone isn't getting better other than resistance. And we truly don't know if Bartonella that is resistant to rifampin is also resistant to rifabutin and under what conditions. Our next question is, can Bartonella be eradicated from the body? Before I answer this question, I wanna tell you a little story. Early on in my illness, I asked one of my practitioners this question, and they said no, and then they said that even after treating the symptoms, my symptoms could pop up later in life, like after a stressful event, including pregnancy. If that sounds like a tactless way to explain this issue to someone newly diagnosed and newly disabled, then you're right! If that sounds like a tactless way of explaining this issue to someone who is 25 and capable of bearing children and therefore may want to carry their own children, then you're right! Never mind, I'm 100% sure that I don't want children, but they don't know that. I was devastated. Not because I don't want to have children, I'm 100% sure about that because they're disgusting. Just kidding. Sort of. But rather, I thought that this was something that I was going to have to constantly worry about for the rest of my life, so approximately 60 more years. It was stuff like this that made me want to create this channel. Practitioners often don't have the time and or skills to explain these things to patients, and they're, some of them are really bad at managing patient expectations. That isn't all their fault, but it's also not not their fault. <laughs> So here is how current me would go back in time to newly diagnosed me and answer this question. The human body is not sterile and we have more microbe cells in our body than human cells. Antibiotics don't necessarily eradicate an infection, they just help you and your immune system get it under control. The goal with Bartonellosis is to achieve and maintain symptom resolution. It remains to be seen if effective antibiotic protocols completely eradicate every single little Bartonella cell, but what we do know is that recovery and remission is possible. Can I pulse antibiotics for Bartonella treatment? Pulsing refers to taking your antibiotics on an on-off schedule, and for example, this could look like taking your antibiotics for one week on and then one week off, it could be four days on and then three days off, or it could be every other day. Pulsing is a tactic that originally came from treating Borrelia burgdorferi, but Borrelia burgdorferi and Bartonella are two completely different bacteria. I can tell you that some of the most experienced and well-respected BLMDs do not pulse antibiotics when treating Bartonellosis. Even though Bartonella is a relatively slow-growing bacteria, Bartonella can and will proliferate during time off of antibiotics. We don't have any research saying how long, and people say that Bartonella divides every 24 hours, but that's different than in the body, and for many bacteria, we actually don't know how quickly it replicates in the body. All this being said, if I had to guess, taking a week off of antibiotics, you will have Bartonella growing back. Taking a week off of antibiotics wouldn't be ideal, but it also wouldn't be the end of the world. 
And I can tell you from personal experience that when I saw symptom reduction after being on a low dose of antibiotics, I held on to that gain for about a month before backsliding. However, some patients do need to pulse or take short breaks, especially in the beginning of treatment if they are too sensitive and or too sick. Some patients don't pulse, but rather start at an extremely low dose and very slowly titrate up from there. I can tell you from my personal experience that both of my BLMDs independently wanted me to start out on 25 milligrams of clarithromycin once a day because my MCAS was so severe. And 1,000 milligrams is the max daily dosage of clarithromycin, so 25 milligrams is 1 40th of the daily dose. I've also discussed with my BLMDs the option of taking chlorothermycin every other day or a four day on, three day off schedule. And while this is an ideal, treatment must be tailored to the individual. So in sum, most expert BLMDs do not pulse antibiotics for bartonellosis unless there is a very strong reason for doing so, like severe MCAS. Can rifampin be pulsed? Hmm, now here's a tricky question. You will see patients online yelling at other patients to never pulse rifampin. As I like to say, there are almost never absolutes in medicine, so let's go over what the science says about this issue. All right, this is gonna get real sciencey. Rifampin, along with many other drugs, including penicillin, can provoke a negative immune response in some individuals, and some individuals can create antibodies against the rifampin. Whether or not this happens depends on many factors. So one is just the individual's body. The second is how high the dosage is. The third is how frequently the medicine is taken. And the fourth is length of treatment. So let's go over each of those factors. One study found that immune reactions occurred in 6% of those who took 600 milligrams a day, as opposed to 28% of those who took 1200 milligrams a day. So what this study shows us is that higher dosages are more likely to provoke a negative immunological response. It's pretty rare to develop antibodies towards rifampin if you take it every day. One study found that patients who took rifampin every single day had only a 0.8% chance of developing antibodies towards the rifampin. However, patients that only took it twice a week had a 21% chance, and patients who only took it once a week had a 31% chance. Adverse immunological responses to rifampin occur more frequently in females than in males, and they occur more frequently in older people rather than younger people. One of the negative immunological responses is referred to as a pseudo-influenza syndrome, and this can present with symptoms like fatigue, headaches, joint pain, muscle pain, fever, and shivering. This syndrome occurs almost exclusively in those who are doing intermittent rifampin treatment, so once or twice weekly dose. The syndrome usually occurs one to two hours after taking the rifampin, and it can last for up to eight hours. And the pseudo-influenza syndrome usually resolves if people start taking the rifampin every single day. But this next part is super important. The syndrome only occurs or usually occurs after three to six months of intermittent rifampin therapy. It doesn't occur immediately. So if in the beginning of treatment, you are too sick to take anything more than only 150 milligrams every other day, Based off of the literature, this is much less risky than taking 600 milligrams or 1200 milligrams only once or twice a week. And the idea is, as you become less sick, you can switch over to daily dosing. Don't take it from me, take it from a Bartonellosis expert. I personally have discussed with Dr. M the possibility of me taking a low dose of rifampin every other day due to my severe mast cell activation syndrome. So pulsing like this with rifampin isn't completely out of the question for all patients. That's why patients online should try to stay away from telling other patients to never do XYZ, unless it's something like eating dog poop. Pulsing rifampin luckily is something that most patients won't need to do, but if you are a patient that needs to do this because of MCAS or some other reason, that's something that you should weigh the pros and cons of with your doctor. Taking a day or two off due to an extreme Herx reaction is also something that you should discuss with your doctor, but I can say from personal experience of reading patient forums incessantly for two years, taking a day or two off of your antibiotics to let the body calm down is something that 
many, if not most, doctors are okay with. There are a few more serious immunological reactions to rifampin that one can have, and I'm not gonna go too deeply into them because they are rare, but they include acute kidney failure, a drop in platelets, and an acute destruction of red blood cells. The authors of an article on the adverse immunological reactions to rifampin write, Quote, in conclusion, adverse immunologic effects are most frequently noted when rifampin is administered in large or intermittent doses, but they appear only after three months of treatment. Okay, that's enough science for today. I guess the take home message from this video is don't believe everything you read or hear, including from me. If you wanna be part of our Flossy Posse, there are a couple of ways to do that. One, you can hit that subscribe button. Two, you can join our Facebook support group called Breaking Down Bartonella. And three, you can follow me on my social media handles. And I would really appreciate it if you would consider giving this video a thumbs up if you learned anything because it really helps my channel. And please leave a comment down below if you have any questions and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Flossy as in flashy and showy, not as in dental hygiene. And if you have any remedies for dog halitosis, please leave that in the comments as well. Bye, Bartonella buddies! Oh. 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 What a sweet lover. B A R T O N E L L A B A R T O N E L L A Right now, I can only provide you with mediocre singing, but when I'm better, I can provide you with mediocre dancing. If you had to guess who the sweeter sister was, who would you guess? I know. <laughs>